Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Happy New Year. We are so glad you can join us tonight, and we really mean that. We are so glad that you can join us tonight. I'm just going to thank God that our science and our care skills are way better than our Zoom skills. So we have a really exciting program this evening. No, we're not going to cut anything out of it. We're going to get everything in. You're going to have a, a chance to hear from several CF Foundation leaders about the progress we're having uh, in CF Cure, Care, and Community. And you know, talking about cure in some ways is especially topical because tonight Steve Rowe, our chief scientific officer, and myself are both coming to you from Boston uh, tonight where our science team has been uh, at a series of meetings with four companies working on the CF Foundation's Path to a Cure who are here in the Boston Science Hub. And so one of the reasons for this background is so you don't have to look at the very attractive hotel room background. Um, before we go, and we have so much for tonight, uh, I just want to remind you to change your chat settings to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your chat. Uh, I know we've I've been seeing the chat and we have people from all around the country. So thank you for being here. We're, we're excited about tonight. I think you can agree. And uh, there's so much to feel hopeful about and also much to be grateful for. And especially, uh, we're especially grateful for you, the amazing CF community. So on behalf of the whole CF Foundation team, I just want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for all that you do to advance our mission every day. As, we, as I mentioned, I said, tonight we're gonna to really mainly focus on research and care. But before I get started, um, I just wanted to announce one thing that's just amazing. And that is that for the first time in three years, our fundraising has reached pre-pandemic levels. So thanks to you, thousands of dedicated volunteers and donors across the country, we are actually really recovering and looking forward in particular, I want to thank everybody who's been part of the Milestones 3 campaign. It's going strong. We have more than $120 million in combined major gifts and legacy commitments. We're now well over the halfway mark to this $200 million effort. And, you know, I think what you're going to hear about tonight is how much your generosity is making possible. Uh, so looking forward to telling you those details. So our format tonight is I'm going to start off by giving you a brief overview of a few of the highlights from this past year. And then we're going to dive into the details. Right, there's a panel discussion with some of our key area leaders and experts. And I'm just gonna to start tonight by highlighting one of the things that we're uh, particularly excited about in, in 2022. And that is that people with CF are today are living longer and fuller lives than ever before. And adults now represent about 60% of the CF population. I know you've already heard that the current median life expectancy for a person born, born with cystic fibrosis now is 53 years of age the single uh, largest single year increase we've ever had, about a three year increase. This is 15 years longer than a decade ago and we fully expect this number to continue to climb. So why can I say that? I think one of our key reasons for being confident is Trikafta. So there was just a, pub a published study just this past month of about 450 people with CF um, who are on Trikafta and showed that for that group on average, those people who've been on Trikafta for about two years, the trikafta led to stable lung function over the two years, so no decline in lung function. This is especially exciting because although previous modulators certainly slowed the decline of lung function, they had not stopped the decline over an extended period of time like this. Obviously, we're going to continue to look at this closely, but incredibly exciting news, and one of those reasons we're more confident than ever about the future. You know, we're working, obviously, to try to get as many people as possible access to trikafta and other modulator therapies to treat the underlying cause of their CF, but also thinking about, you'll hear tonight about advancing the next generation of potentially even better modulator treatments. And of course, 
we always keep in mind that not everyone in CF can benefit from modulators, which is why we're doing all we can in our path to cure work and our determination to cure cystic fibrosis. You know, this past year, we continued moving forward on the Path to a Cure initiative. Remember, this is our $500 million commitment to ensure that the world's best science is applied to our work to find a cure for cystic fibrosis. And we're engaging with companies all across the country and, and tonight in, uh, and today in Boston, some of those who are focused on that. And we're not just working for someday. Those clinical trials for genetic therapies are already starting this year. They're underway, getting into the clinic. So we're already starting to see some of the fruition of that effort. And uh, obviously we're excited because we need to benefit those people who can't ben uh, benefit from modulators. And eventually this technology will benefit everyone with cystic fibrosis. Now, in terms of care, we know that multidisciplinary teams are our heroes, right? Across the country, providing the best care possible. Over 130 accredited CF care centers and by partnering closely with people with CF and their families, these dedicated teams are meeting the changing and the complex needs of, of not only children, but also the growing adult CF population. And we know that means addressing some of the challenges that can come along, right? So whether that's infection or advanced lung disease or mental health challenges, making sure that we tailor those therapies for each person's unique uh, journey. And this past year, we continue to place a strong effort of collaborating with you and working with the CF community to advance our work together. With many of you having a chance to share perspectives, to inform our programs, to shape our strategies and our programs. I think one of those in particular has been our focus and our sort of our ongoing commitment to making sure that we help advance health equity and racial justice and diversity and inclusion. So last year in partnership with the CF community, we took some great steps to better understand the experience of everyone, particularly underrepresented people with CF, and identify opportunities to address the unique challenges that they face. And of course, one of the brightest highlights of 2022 was being able to gather again in person, hundreds of events nationwide. This included connecting at some of our most inspiring virtual events led by people with CF, including BreatheCon and Rose Up. And then maybe just a couple other, two, two particular people I wanna mention, one is, the opportunity this past year to welcome our new, our new chief scientific officer, Dr. Stephen Rowe. You know, as his role in, in as chief scientific officer, Steve oversees the foundation's basic science and the academic research programs, along with our recently expanded, significantly expanded lab here in Boston, and obviously our expanding path to a cure portfolio. Um, as you know, Dr. Rowe is respected globally for his work in CF research, particularly expertise in genetic therapies and his work on CF nonsense mutations. And we're going to hear a lot of those details in a second. And of course, the other person I have to mention is our new board chair, KC White. KC uh, is helping to guide us as our leader and the board of trustees. As a person with CF, KC brings a deep understanding of our community to this new role. She's so passionate about our shared mission. And obviously she's building on the remarkable legacy of our immediate past chair, Cam McLeod. Cam's had been an extraordinary leader for us and just served the community for decades. We're so grateful for her. So, you know, we are in a new era of CF. We have so many reasons to be hopeful for what lies ahead, but of course, still a lot of work to do. And we're gonna talk about that tonight. The top of our list is to working to ensure that every person born with CF has a chance to live a long, healthy life and ultimately to fulfill their dreams. So let's hear, before we get into the science, let's hear from several members of the community about what they're excited about for the future. I think our hopes and dreams are like any other parents' hopes and dreams and that we wanna see not just Abigail, but both of our girls thrive into adulthood and get to live out the lives that they choose to live. Quality of life, for CFRs has, have improved so much. And now this dream seems uh, even closer and closer, you know, that uh, one day each and every CF patient would have a cure. My health has improved tremendously. I went from being considered underweight to in the normal category. I was able to complete my master's degree. And to be honest, I didn't know if I would make it to see that. I didn't know if I'd have the strength the ability to be able to make it through that. I'm so in awe and amazed at how far we've come to curing CF and the advancements that they've made. Going through what I've gone through and sort of my perspective after has just ignited me to want to raise even more awareness. I think there's only more good things to come. In the perfect world, my hopes and my dreams 
would be a cure for cystic fibrosis. If there's no cure, I hope for those therapies and better medicine and less workload for CFers. That would be perfect. All this advancement in science, um, all the countless numbers of hours put in all these researchers, scientists, CF Foundation employees, their sole mission is just to find the cure. And now we are the, we are the part of this big family. When I have been at different events for the CF Foundation and met parents who have adult children with cystic fibrosis, I'm so encouraged. If I were to say anything to you know, people that are working on CF, researchers, scientists, it would be don't give up because you know, our daughter's life depends on it. All right, well, that kick off that next section for us. So thank you, Adrian and Jordan and Amita and Mariah and Lauren and Trey for, for sharing your reflections and inspiring all of us. And now we're going to move into the section that I know many of you have been looking forward to, and that's the conversation with some of our world-class leaders from here at the foundation. Before we do that, um, I'm going to remind you, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. We're monitoring that. We're going to actually uh, going through those. We owe you some time back, so we'll make sure we spend some time answering those questions. I'm going to answer as many as we can. I'm going to that entire panel to come on right now and introduce them, and then we'll go and start talking to them individually. But uh, I want to introduce, and, and I'd like you to welcome our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Stephen Rowe, our Senior Vice President of Clinical Trials, Dr. J.P. Clancy, our Chief Policy and Advocacy Officer, Mary Dwight, our Senior Director of Biopharma Programs, Tiffany Burnett, and our Senior Director of Clinical Affairs, Dr. Whitney Brown. So uh, let's welcome, welcome them warmly and I'm going, to, I'm going to turn to you first, Steve, and uh, obviously we've been talking uh, uh, a lot about the future, and we're known for our commitment to innovation, right? And can you discuss some of the ways in which we're continuing to be innovative, really driving that innovative research forward for all people with CF and specifically around the Path to a Cure initiative? Sure, Mike, I'm happy to. Uh, we're certainly not waiting for scientific advances to come to us. Instead, we're really boldly driving research forward and to help them move the needle more quickly. CF Foundation's innovative research enterprise really is an ecosystem that brings together the right people from leading companies as well as cutting edge research institutions to pursue promising ideas using the newest tools and technologies across research disciplines. Our own laboratory uh, here in Boston and uh, which I'm gonna visit tomorrow and expertise at the CF Foundation is another major part of that effort. And as you said, the heart of this innovation really right now is the Path to a Cure initiative. This is a $500 million commitment to ensure the world's best science is applied to advance the development of genetic therapies to find a cure for CF. And as you mentioned, Mike, what we're actively identifying and funding innovative research spearheaded by leading biotech and now venture capital firms. In order to attract these businesses into what has been perceived as a higher risk area of research, we're providing major incentives and really why the CF e ecosystem is so special, including the best of in-class set of tools and infrastructure, in addition to financial investments to entice them into CF. This unique approach and robust ecosystem of support makes us uniquely positioned to accelerate commercial programs and give them the best opportunity to success. We remain active in the infection and supportive care, both within and beyond the lung, and the evaluation of new partnerships where it makes sense to do so. For example, we're really watching closely and considering new partnerships with those treating non-CF bronchiectasis, since it has so much in common with CF and may be an easier and faster way to develop certain medicines in the current era of therapy. Within PTAC, it's already paying off. We have a 35 major industry research programs already in place and they cover a wide range of therapies uh, in the genetic area. Many of these companies are receiving funding from early stage research into potential genetic therapies. As we, we know, these therapies are, are, are the key to curing CF. Yeah, Steve, I was just reflecting on our meetings today, right? We certainly have the attention of the scientific community where 
some of these companies that are really well known for their genetic technologies are uh, looking into CF because of some of the things that are, are going on here, and uh, particularly the path to a cure. Uh, I was just uh, thinking about the, some of the discussions we had today and that excitement around that. So you mentioned uh, sort of leading biotech companies, venture capital firms. Um, can you talk specifically about sort of the newest work underway in, 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 that, in those areas to advance genetic-based therapies? Sure. Well, uh, obviously, we're here in Boston. One of the reasons is we were working with flagship pioneering and pioneering medicine. Uh, and this is a pretty uh, uh, interesting and innovative uh, collaboration that we forged. It's three companies collaborating all under one umbrella. So there's now five partners, including, including our own. Uh, this is key because delivering to the lung, delivering to the right cells at the right time uh, with the appropriate level of gene editing or gene delivery all need to occur. And so these various companies bring that expertise together. It's separate resources of their sort are sometimes hard to find under one roof. Uh, we can do this um, in, in this collaboration that includes companies Omega, Tesla, and Laurent. We're bringing to this different expertise under the uh, together under this unique collaborative effort. Another aspect uh, that's unusual is that we're working hand in hand with these companies. Aside from the traditional advisory position at CFF and beyond, we're also embarking on collective experiments and the technology to speed them along. They're spending time uh, in our Boston lab, for example, and ex exchanging resources and reagents, as well as experimental results to make things go faster. Another example is Longwood Fund. Uh, a biotechnology uh, focused on a venture capital firm. They've already formed two companies uh, with, with our help uh, in selecting them, vetting them, and then uh, uh, they uh, really bring their specialty in forming companies that are go on to be successful. We work on them uh, from the onset and throughout. Through opportunities of this sort, we're really finding them earlier and trying to help them plant CF really as part of the DNA. Uh, of these companies and to keep it at the forefront uh, throughout their development path. Initially, we have five clinical trials for CF genetic therapies that are already underway uh, right now uh, and or will begin in the next 18 months. This includes three mRNA therapies and two uh, traditional uh, gene therapy pro uh, programs. Soon to the, be at the forefront, which I know uh, JP Clancy has been uh, thinking about is these mRNA therapies. Uh, they're unique uh, because uh, mRNA uh, is more of a transient therapy. Uh, it can be, uh, be the signal that uh, creates the CFTR protein. Uh, and this is a really important initial step to get to one-time cure because they can work on people without modulators and bring CFTR therapy to those individuals. They have the potential to work on people with modulators and those individuals that need a boost and they rely on the same sort of delivery technologies that we'll need for the ultimate genetic cure or gene editing approaches. Uh, so we're gonna learn a lot from this along with uh, being uh, uh, really early uh, to, uh, attempts to, to help people that are not currently being affected by CFTR modulators. Right, well, I agree with you about some of the excitement on the, the RNA part. And uh, uh, again, really exciting to actually see it coming into clinic uh, rather than, uh, Waiting. So JP, thanks for popping on because I wanted to ask you, because as leading a lot of our clinical trials, uh, can you talk to us about those genetic-based therapy clinical trials? And so the ones that are either ongoing or about to, about to get going. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. And welcome everybody. It's so good to have you here tonight. Um, there is so much activity in this space right now, and I'm really happy to update you on a few of the topics, but I think will be really exciting and of interest to uh, people listening online. Uh, the first is 4D Molecular. Uh, it's a company that is developing an AAV-based AAV inhaled uh, genetic-based therapy. Um, this trial began in the first half of 2022. Um, and presented some very early data at the North American CF conference last year, November. Now, it's too soon to draw firm conclusions, but they did see evidence that their vector was being taken up by airway cells of people with CF who had received that uh, therapy. And it, they, it was expressing, those cells were expressing the CFTR transgene. We are so excited about this early success, and we really obviously hope that it's going to translate into clinical benefit. The second thing I would like to highlight is just the sheer volume of interest and activity in genetic based therapy studies that are coming to the TDN. Uh, we know that at least seven companies have, have protocols in development and are in the discussion with the TDN Coordinating Center, the CFF, et cetera, covering such approaches as AAV, mRNA, and some other viral carrier molecules. 
And finally, I wanted to let you know that um, to prepare for this new reality that we're walking into, two years ago, we assembled a group of experts in academics called the Genetic Therapies Working Group, coupled with members of the CF community. And this group is really focused on the need to educate community and care teams in addition to providing that important guidance for preclinical data and early trial designs to companies. So JP, it's interesting because at today's meeting, uh, there was a, a couple of the companies said, wouldn't it be great if we started working ahead and starting planning for those trials and maybe had a group that was talking to the FDA and thinking about this ahead? And I said, huh, it's a good idea. <laughs> Guess what? We're already doing it. And uh, so you're going to have a, a little bit of foot traffic coming your way because people are excited about that. So I'm excited about this idea of thinking ahead, getting prepared. Um, as that group's got together, the experts, what are some of the things that you see that we're going to need to do differently in the future? Because these are different types of uh, trials than just the modulators in the past. Yeah, they're, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Mike. They are different. They're, they're not going to be as large. They're not going to be as, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to have near the numbers of people. But also the folks that we enroll in these studies are a different group. Um, a significant por percentage of the people who are not eligible to take modulators are people of color. And we are going to absolutely need to engage all people with CF to participate in these clinical trials if we're going to be successful in advancing these therapies. Honestly, in the past, we've really not done a very good job uh, historically engaging black and brown people with CF into clinical trials. And we are going to need some really different strategies to be successful. Uh, we have a lot of examples. I think we're making some, we're making some progress on this front. Um, first of all, we've done some very basic work to benchmark what the demographics of our research teams look like, knowing that it's really important uh, for people of color to have uh, interest and trust in uh, participating in clinical research. We've engaged with Black and Hispanic communities to better understand their concerns. Uh, we're sharing best practices and how to engage and how to best recruit people of color into clinical research. And finally, I was just mentioning we're organizing our care and research center sites into regional cooperatives, which are really going to focus on being able to enhance referrals. I am really uh, excited about this. And indeed, um, we really think uh, some of these changes are going to fundamentally change the way we do research. And I'm so looking forward to the fruits of these uh, efforts and see how they translate into outcomes and, and uh, better clinical trials. Well, thank you, JP. I think the part that st has struck me through all these discussions, just saying it's going to be essential that if we're going to advance genetic therapies, that we uh, really engage and serve all people with CF Absolutely. from a very diverse CF community. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to get these trials done. And so this is something, it fits well with some of the work we've been doing, though, on the care side and some other areas. And uh, it's going to enable us really to deliver our mission. So I'm going to invite Mary Dwight on. So Mary, can you come on? Because I know you've been one of our key people that's helping to lead as we work in our commitment to the diversity and inclusion and thinking about how we make sure that we uh, best address the entire CF community. But can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, really thrilled to build on what you and JP have, have been talking about. You know, as you both noted, cystic fibrosis is a disease that affects people of every racial and ethnic group. And as you said at the top, we are committed to advancing efforts in health equity and inclusion because these efforts are really essential to who we are and how we deliver on our mission to help provide all people with CF the opportunity to live long and fulfilling lives. So last year we took several crucial steps to better understand the experiences of underrepresented people with CF, particularly the challenges of, that communities of color face so for example, we convened a working group that's been at it for a year plus um, and partnered with the community to better understand the unique barriers and the challenges that black people with CF experience and to identify ways to improve our programs, our processes and our policies to advance more equitable outcomes. So Mary, that sounds really good. And I, I understand how essential it is if we're gonna deliver our mission, knowing about the, the makeup of the, that group that doesn't, uh, isn't eligible for modulators, but can you give me some practical examples, maybe of a program that's coming out of this, that's gonna make a difference in, in the outcomes. We wanna make a difference in outcomes for people with CF. Yeah, we wanna, we wanna see progress, right? We wanna make sure this is right on mission and, and within our role. Newborn screening is a great example of how this commitment of health equity really ties to our mission. So let me back up with a little bit of, of background here. Newborn screening has been an incredibly valuable tool to help improve health outcomes in cystic fibrosis. As newborn screening for CF expanded, and now it includes every state, every state screens babies for CF, 
more babies have been able to get that high quality specialty care they need at an earlier age. And numerous studies have demonstrated the value of that earlier diagnosis, which has so many clinical benefits. But the thing is that every state screens differently for CF. Um, and that newborn screening is not equitable across all 50 states. We know it's led to improved clinical outcomes, but again, not equally for everyone with CF. We know that racial and ethnic disparities in newborn screening DNA panels exist. Put simply, babies of color are too often missed because their genetic mutation is not included in their state screening panel. And these omissions lead to delayed diagnosis, and poorer health outcomes. So the goal of this work is to improve that equity, sensitivity, and timeliness in diagnosing babies with CF to improve health for all babies. It's a multifaceted initiative with work including development of consensus guidelines, advocacy in targeted states to implement those best practices that emerge from those guidelines, and really working with a diverse group of stakeholders, both from within the CF community and beyond, groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National State and Public Health Labs. So we're excited about this work, and we hope that it will really ensure all people, all babies born with CF, get the best care possible at the earliest stage. And I think it's a great example of that commitment of equity, racial justice, and diversity and inclusion at our core principle coming into a practical programmatic approach. It's the heart of our mission. Well, Mary, thank you. That is a, it's a powerful, practical example. So grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, let's ask Whitney Brown on next to come tell us about uh, CARE and the CARE Network. So uh, Dr. Brown, every day, there are just amazing CARE teams that deliver specialized care at CF Care Centers across the country. And we get to see the results of that great care by the data in the CFF patient registry. So you're, you're attuned to this. Can you talk about some of the trends that you're seeing in care based on what we're seeing in the patient registry uh, uh, data? Oops, actually, Whitney, you want to turn your, turn your uh, microphone on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was so excited, I forgot to turn on my mic. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, thanks so much. At our care centers, people with CF can participate in the CF Foundation Patient Registry, as you mentioned, and that really helps us track trends and guide decisions about where to invest in care and research. And based on the registry data, broadly speaking, the CF population is doing very well. So to start, there are more people living with CF, now estimated to be about 40,000 in the US. And this increases because more people are living longer. And as you mentioned, the median expected survival age is now up to 53, and we expect that number to climb as new therapies become available. And the favorable trends in lung function and infection rates and in pulmonary exacerbations that we saw in the 2020 data continued in the 2021 data. For example, we saw that lung function increased from the prior year in every age group and pulmonary exacerbations were down with only 10% of children and 14% of adults needing IV antibiotics, which in, in actual fact is less than what was less than half of what was seen in 2019. And the number of people with CF who need a lung transplant continues to decrease uh, with only 32 transplants for people in, uh, with CF in the United States uh, in 2022, and very few on the wait list. And for context, prior to 2019, uh, about 250 individuals with CF received a transplant each year. So these are very strong indicators that the wide use of modulator therapy, uh, Trikapta, is contributing to better health outcomes. And we are looking forward to the FDA approval for children down um, ages two to five and, and even younger in the future. But there is still uh, a lot of work to be done. There are many, as you mentioned, who are not eligible and are not benefiting from Trikapta. They are waiting on a transformative therapy and struggling with the day-to-day -day challenges of life with CF. And they very much need our, our continued support, the support of our care teams and of our community. Yeah, well, thank you, Whitney. I know we're gonna bring you back and hear a lot more uh, from you later on, but since you sort of mentioned some of this continued transformation of therapy, I wanna, bring Steve Rowe back on. And Steve, I think we think about the transformative therapies on the horizon. Some of those are you know, genetic based. We were talking about those, but another part is being able to just advance the modulators and even better versions of the modulators, better versions of Trikafta, younger 
treatment. Can you can you talk a little bit about our work, not just in the genetic based therapies, but actually sort of the future for modulator therapies? Sure, happy to talk about it. It's what brought a lot of us to the field, including including me in those early days. Uh, there's been a ton of progress uh, with uh, the next generation of modulator therapies. You heard from Whitney about the absolutely transformational transformational nature of these medicines and what they're doing to people with CF as a whole. And now the work, one set of the work is to, to help expand this as fast as possible uh, to the people that could benefit. So one, one is to bring the age down. You heard from Whitney about the recent approval for ages two to five for people with trikafta in September earlier last year, or, or at the end of last year, the FDA approved Orcombi for eight children ages one to two years old uh, and uh, with, with two F508 DEL mutations. And uh, you know that Ivacaptor has been available even for uh, children of, of, of youngest infants uh, for, for some time. All of this opens up new areas to combat disease before uh, it really starts. Uh, we're already seeing evidence that we can reverse uh, pancreatic dysfunction. And that is uh, tremendously exciting that we could then uh, think about doing that to a broader group of people as the age groups uh, come down for, for trikafta. There's also progress in the development of other new and potentially better uh, modulator therapies. We want people to have a, have a choice, and, and especially for those individuals that can't tolerate uh, current modulators. Uh, there's a few that I'll bring to your attention that are that are in that late stage development that we're excited about. One is uh, Abby. They're currently uh, enrolling a phase two trial of a new triple combination uh, medication, same concept of CFTR modulators, uh, 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 as, as you know. Uh, this is Galacaftor, Navacaftor, and AV576. Er earlier this year, the CF Foundation also supported Siona Therapeutics with a $5 million award to bring their uh, CFTR modulators uh, results to the clinic. This was based on really impressive uh, laboratory results uh, that were reported in November. And they're now starting early phase clinical trials. And what the thing that's unique about this is that this includes an entirely new class of modulator uh, with a repair mechanism that was not previously described. Uh, and uh, this could ultimately expand uh, and work better uh, in some cases or expand to other uh, misfolding mutations. And finally, uh, uh, this year, Vertex Pharmaceuticals continues uh, their great work. They're now continuing a, a late stage development in a, a triple combination based on uh, the molecule VX121. Uh, this is a three drug combination that promises a once daily therapy. And also there's laboratory evidence that, that it may be even uh, superior so, uh, to what's currently available. So as a whole, all of this uh, is able, helping us find CFTR modulators for a greater number of people uh, that work even better uh, and bring choice uh, to, uh, to, uh, to people with CF. Beyond our, our work to provide uh, more therapeutic options, we're also studying the impact of these CFTR modulators. I did a lot of the work, that work myself uh, uh, before joining uh, the, the foundation. These work, studies are unique because they wouldn't be perfor uh, performed otherwise uh, uh, without um, the support of the CF Foundation because many are independent of the CF Foundation. Uh, 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 of the pharmaceutical companies and allow uh, these unique questions to be asked and would not otherwise uh, be studied. That's great. Well, Steve, I think one of the things that is particularly, uh, I think, exciting is the way we continue to learn more and more about the effects of Trikaft and other highly effective modulators and the number of studies that we have to learn about all those different aspects. And maybe I'm going to ask, I know you were involved with that a lot, but I'm going to ask JP to come on and to talk specifically, JP, you've got a whole... Uh, a hand of different, uh, you know, a card hand of different trials going on to teach us about the different aspects of Trikafta and modulators. And uh, can you tell us about those? Sure, it could go on a long time, but uh, just to make sure we get this tied up. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to some of the high points. Uh, first, um, there were there were a number of studies uh, that we're calling the Promise studies um, that are ongoing. Uh, the first sort of cuts, first look at that data was published earlier this year and presented at North American CF Conference. And these are really large studies that are trying to holistically look at CF across many, many of the manifestations of disease. The kind of the parent study has demonstrated lots of benefits outside of the kind of confines that are usually used in clinical trial parameters. And this includes improvements in lung function, symptoms, weight, clinical stability, et cetera, et cetera. 
And if you looked at the average person who is a person with CF who's taking Trikafta, who was in that study, um, they were in their mid 20s, they had normal lung function and they had normal weight. Um, we were also uh, seeing some really exciting improvements in infection and also looking at other aspects of CF, such as uh, control of diabetes and symptoms uh, from the GI tract. A uh, related study is called the PROMISE 6 to 11 year old study, which again includes younger patients with CF. And it confirmed a lot of the results from the parent study, um, but it also um, it began to show some, uh, some improvements in lung function that were really sort of unique and special and harder to measure in these uh, younger patients. Next study I'm gonna mention is called BEGIN. And in, it's kind of similar to PROMISE in principle, um, but it's being conducted in our youngest kids with CF. Uh, currently, it's in a run-in phase, and uh, this is for children under the age of six, and uh, we're gathering natural history, history data right now, and once we see approval of Trikafta, we will then be able to start uh, looking at a variety of outcome measures in that cohort as they go on to drug. A different approach that has been taken by the CF Foundation uh, is that the HERO2 study and this is a real world research approach in um, which we're asking people with CF about how they are using their medications and therapies while they're taking Trikafta. This multi-center study was the first to be done entirely remote and we intend to have some data to share over the next several months, really starting to understand how people are using their current therapies in CF. We're also supporting a number of complementary, complementary studies in Europe and in Canada um, in CFF supported uh, clinical trial networks. So hopefully we'll be seeing some of those results very soon. Last thing I'll mention uh, is uh, results of the Simplify study. Uh, these were presented at the 2022 North American CF conference and also were just published soon after. Uh, the study was really the first to ask a very fundamental question can we reduce the treatments needed to manage lung disease and CF for people who are stable and taking Trikafta? The study found that those with good lung function did not lose any lung function when they stopped hypertonic saline or pulmazine for up to six weeks. Now it's probably too early to extrapolate those results to everybody with CF, but I am so excited about those results. And they do suggest that reducing treatment burden, care in, and care burden in CF is real and is a real possibility. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you. That has been a big topic of conversation in clinic, this possibility of, uh, of tinkering with, uh, with uh, the daily regimen and, and, and still doing well. So lots to learn, but it's great to have some data on that. Um, Whitney, I think we said we were going to uh, ask you to come back on, and I'm going to uh, do that now. And, you know, we're talking a lot about some of the successes, right? Some of the things that are, are going well, some of the excitement there. But the reality is, reality is, is there's still a lot of challenges in day-to-day -day in CF, particularly in adults with CF, and whether that's infection-related or mental health or um, just advanced lung disease. But I know this is an area of particular interest to you, and you you still take care of it in the clinic. But can you talk some about that and what we're doing in that area? Yes, thanks. Um, let me first talk about those with advanced lung disease and those who have already undergone lung transplant. Uh, we continue to invest in the Lung Transplant Consortium and several other research programs that really are focused on preventing, detecting, and ultimately treating CLAD. And CLAD stands for Chronic Lung Allograft Dysfunction, which is the leading complication after lung transplant. And we are also excited to support a paper that has recently been uh, submitted for publication, which outlines possible ways to share care between lung transplant programs and CF programs to really optimize health outcomes for people with CF after transplant. And even though I mentioned the, the need for lung transplant has decreased for those with CF, we're really not slowing down on our commitment to those with advanced lung disease. Um, and this includes a more, more dedicated analysis this year of registry trends in the advanced lung disease population, because we need to ensure that, we, that the right care, including lung transplant, is available when needed. Um, another area that's getting a lot of our attention is mental health. And like the general population, we see increases in anxiety and depression in the registry. And that cuts across all ages and stages of health. And this is an uh, absolute priority to address. Uh, we have formed a new mental health research working group. And this is a group that's specifically looking at what research do we need to conduct for people with CF in this space. And we are already funding several research studies to evaluate behavioral therapy um, for stress management, for anxiety, 
and for depression in teens and adults uh, with CF. And some of the interventions being tested include mindfulness therapy, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and lastly, although I mentioned also that infection rates um, appear to be decreasing in the registry, infections are really uh, a complication that most, if not all people with CF will experience. And the Infection Research Initiative is a, is a great example of work we're diligently advancing in this space. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thank you. And uh, obviously an area of continued attention. Of course, when you talk about infection, that signals asking Tiffany to come on. So Tiffany, if you wanna come on, uh, you've been leading so much and, and playing such a big role in our infection research initiative. Um, I'd love to hear about some of the progress we're seeing there. So, well, tell me about some of the things that you're working on. Thanks, Mike. I'm happy to share an update on the initiative. Um, we are moving into our fifth year of the initiative. And as we move into the fifth year, we are attracting new research um, that ultimately leads to new therapeutics to fight infection. That remains our focus. We are also keeping front of mind that diverse needs of the community when it comes to infection management. Um, while JP and Whitney so wonderfully shared that infection rates are trending down with Trichapta for many, we realize that this is not the case for everyone and infection does remain a top priority here at the foundation. I'm pleased to share that we continue to follow and support great and innovative science. We're exceeding the initiative's investment target with over $135 million awarded to date. Um, we've also doubled our industry portfolio. We're funding over 25 drug development programs across different pathogens and stages of development. And we also have awarded over 250 basic research and clinical grants. Um, our steering committee, uh, which is comprised of CF experts and opinion leaders, CF staff, and as well as community members, we convened back in December for our first fourth annual meeting. And it was great, it was exciting and lots of great things to talk about leading from NACHC as well as our research uh, uh, meeting this summer. Um, but we were able to really hear uh, directly from the community and that's what matters most. And we were able to hear from the community on what matters most and that was truly enlightening. So I'd like to just give a special thanks to our steering committee in general for helping to lead uh, all the great work we're doing in infection, but a special thanks to our community members, um, Ella Balassa, Kirsten Kulik, uh, Jennifer Spalding, and Mary Lee Phillip who actually serves as our co-chair. And I'd also like to uh, give a shout out to Dara Riva, who actually co-leads this initiative with me, but she is a very important member of our community as well. Um, so thank you all, you know, really for just helping us to really just uh, prioritize and align our research objectives and just focus on what's most important. Um, the last thing I'll say, Mike, is this year, many of our programs will yield data critical data, right, that will inform us of our future infection strategy and needs. And this is exciting because it's really exciting to make decisions based on data. So looking forward to that. Well, I'm going to echo your thanks to Dara, because I know you guys have partnered on this and it's been great to see the progress. So Tiffany, you talked about a lot of numbers of the number of things we're doing, but can you highlight a couple of specifics? Give us some specifics on some of the programs that you're, you're spending extra time with or that you're excited about. Absolutely. Um, with the focus on science and community needs, Mike, we've really diversified our portfolio, not just from a modality perspective, but also from a stage of development perspective. So we have a number of programs in our discovery phase, our preclinical phase, as well as our clinical development phase. Um, and since we started the Infection Research Initiative in 2018, um, we are funding eight drug development programs in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, three of those programs happen to be bacteriophage or phage. And I know that's an exciting topic for our community. Um, but just a little bit of background for phage, for those who aren't as familiar with it, phages are actually viruses that selectively target and kill bacteria. So it's actually using biology's own mechanism to fight CF infections, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Um, and since phage has come into the mainstream a couple of years ago, we've seen a shift from observational and compassionate use studies to more controlled, rigorous, 
systematic and clinical approaches. And this gives me hope that this will lead to greater access for, for more people. Um, but just to highlight a few of our programs in phage, Mike, we have a program called Armada, which recently announced the completion of their phase 1B, 2A clinical trial to test safety and tolerability of phage therapy and pseudomonas with uh, people living with CF. So it's really for our community. And this uh, company has reported that top line results will be available first half of this year. So that's exciting. We also have another company that we're funding called Biomics and they also have a phase 1B to A clinical trial underway. They started dosing patients back in 2022 and they also are saying that they'll have data available this year. So we'll be able to make some decisions on our phage programs and potentially support them further. I know I, it's exciting to see starting to get that data part, right? Because there's so many, actually so many different flavors of the phage. It's nice to be able to start to say, okay, well, these are the ones that actually may make sense uh, to be able to focus on. So right. how about other things, other things besides phage? Yeah, we have a lot. As I said, we have 25 programs, but I think I'll um, highlight a few of our non-traditional anti-infective programs. And these programs really attack the underlying causes of infection. So this potentially give us broader coverage and other pathogens. So, you know, a lot of our our um, non-traditional anti-infectives cover multi-pathogens. Um, and they also have a potential to fight antibiotic resistance. So this is why this is an, um, kind of an important area for us. Um, but in December, we announced our continued support of Aridus Pharmaceuticals in their inhaled gallium program. Uh, we invested 4.8 million and they are actually going to be showing top line results of the first half of that study sometime in the first half of this year. Um, also, we support a program called Beyond Dare. Um, and they reported positive safety, tolerability, and efficacy data in October from their Lung Fit Go pilot study of inhaled nitric oxide for treatment of NTM in people with CF. So, you know, again, showing progress and how we're moving through the pipeline is always important. Um, but I did want to just highlight that the drug uh, regulatory process is very complicated. I think we, we've talked about that before, as is the global funding policy and reimbursement processes in the infection space. So we still have some challenges, although we have a pretty full uh, pipeline. Uh, but, you know, the CF Foundation will continue to support and invest in innovative science and hope that more people have access to new and better antibiotics to tackle difficult to treat infections when they need them. So... We're, we'll stay busy in this space for sure. Absolutely, thank you, Tiffany. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned the NTM part. I'm sure there's some people there who have uh, uh, that as a particular interest for them. And um, of course, when we talk about sort of this difficult to treat infections and antibiotics, uh, Mary Dwight, I'd love to hear an update. I know your team has worked hard in working with the policymakers to try to teach them about the importance of developing new and more robust antibiotics. So, can you give us a little update about the Pasteur Act, where we're at, where's where we're close, where we still need to you know, fill us in. Yeah, so we've got all these amazing promising therapies that Tiffany just highlighted. And we, as she alluded to, there are a couple other pieces of the puzzle to get antibiotics and a broad array of antibiotics into the hands of people with CF and, and frankly, anyone who needs antibiotics. So, um, you know, what, what we really are thinking about is the market for antibiotics is challenged and some would even say broken. What do I mean by that? Um, so things we know, antibiotics rarely command a high price and they're generally prescribed for very brief durations outside of CF. So as we also know really well in the CF community, the effectiveness of antibiotics can weaken over time to the development of resistance. And because of this, we want doctors to practice safe stewardship using those new antibiotics when they come very sparingly and over only when really medically appropriate. We want those new treatments that Tiffany's working so hard to develop to sit on the shelf unless they're absolutely necessary. And that's not always the best business model for a company to be uh, incited to, to develop something that's, that we don't want to be used very frequently. So all of these factors, unfortunately, existing today have created a disincentive to develop new antibiotics because the market on the other end is challenging. So the Pasteur Act is designed to fix that, to fix that broken market. And I'm really proud to say that the CF Foundation really 
uh, bolstered by the amazing voices of our community and powerful stories of people with CF and their need for antibiotics has been a leading champion for the passage of this bill, the Pasteur Act. It's a bipartisan, bicameral bill that's designed to address this market challenge to jumpstart the development of desperately needed new antibiotics for people with CF and frankly, everyone who's affected by antibiotic resistance. It's gonna address that core issue of the market um, by establishing a contract mod model for qualifying antibiotics, which creates a guaranteed payment structure based not on sales volume, but on the value of that new drug. And so it really encourages companies to get into the antibiotic space. It's a top federal priority for us in 2023 we were really close to getting it across the finish line last month in December, down to really the last 24 or 36 hours of congressional negotiation. We've got the attention of leadership on both sides of the aisle and on both sides, House and Senate. So we're, we are going to make a concerted push again with our partners and really with the stories of people with CF to get this important tool passed. Yes, I know how close it was because you were in those last uh, couple of days where uh, keeping the fingers crossed. So uh, you know what? This is what we do. We keep it after it until we're successful. So thank you. Thank um, you. And our last couple of uh, things, I want to actually invite uh, Whitney. We might be back on. We've been talking a lot about the future for therapies, right? But there's a future for care, right? We have to tailor the care to get this right. And this is going to take some thought, okay? Because, But anyway, you want to talk a little bit about some of the work and thinking about the future of care and, and how we're trying to get that right? Absolutely. Um, as you know, we at the CF Foundation, we um, our, our ultimate goal is to ensure that highly specialized care is available for all. And we do this by funding, accrediting, investing in training, and recruiting next generation care teams. Um, with COVID-19 and Trikapta, the need to customize care to meet unique uh, patient needs has really become more evident. Uh, than ever. And, and uh, during this time, many innovative ideas and processes have emerged from programs around the country. Uh, so what we want to do is test the broader benefit of some of these ideas, these change ideas. And I am excited to share that we've awarded six multi-care center teams across the country funding to study these uh, in, in sort of a quality improvement lens to study care, uh, care changes in the, in the care model. And these grants are designed to answer practical questions about care, like um, how should we best integrate telehealth? Um, what should we do with home spirometry? Um, how, how to run sick visits from, from telehealth versus in clinic, uh, collecting home cultures and using apps to manage health. And one of them actually is, is focused on different ways that care teams can discover and assist with non-medical factors that influence health. Uh, something that is called social determinants of health. Um, and, that, and an example of that would be transportation to clinic visits. So we are really looking forward to the results of this important work that's happening around at, these, at, at our clinics uh, around the country to really see what new practices will benefit all people with CF. Um, so the care delivery continues to adapt to meet our patients uh, and communities needs, but it's really critical that we ensure access to this care, mm. uh, not only to treatments, telehealth, clinic, and, and really for all people with CF. Uh, well, thank you. Well, between you and Al Farrow and Bruce Marshall, we're confident that you guys are figuring this out for us. So thank you. Um, and actually, you know, Mary, I'm gonna invite you back on because I think as we're talking about the future, we've talked about future and cure, we talked about it in, in some of the care part, but is sort of the our plans and advocacy and how we're going about the, taking those on. You just wanna talk in general about what the things we're doing and what we're gonna be uh, headed towards? Sure, I'm always happy to talk about that, Mike. Um, you know, really our federal and state advocacy efforts support the entire mission, ensuring everyone with CF has access to that high quality specialized care that Whitney just talked about, all these amazing therapies coming down the pipeline and the ones that are already out there. So we really evaluate all our policy and legislation through one lens. How will this impact people with CF and their families? So I really think our, our agenda is broad. It's everything you've heard tonight from promising new discoveries in CF pipeline. I mentioned the Pasteur Act as, a, as probably the top federal priority. Um, and also all these amazing advancements we partner really closely with the clinical care team uh, and all, a lot of the things that Whitney just talked about, telehealth, um, 
some of the outside factors like getting rides to a uh, care clinic, is that covered, um, food uh, affordability. Um, we really want to promote policies to help ensure that all people with CF have access to that care and uh, at an adequate and affordable health insurance. So we spend a lot of time examining how that health insurance really is it covering what it needs to and is it affordable. Um, you know, I want to give a shout out to some important things that were passed last year, really important provisions that we'd supported for a long time became law, a new cap on Medicare enrollees out, annual out of pocket drug costs that will go into effect in 2025. Um, that's going to be enormous, especially for some of the higher cost CF therapies and also enhanced premium subsidies for people who enroll in marketplace plans. We're seeing more and more people with CF shift into marketplace plans. And we worked really hard with a whole coalition of patient groups to make those um, subsidies bigger and available to more people so that ultimately high quality health insurance is affordable. Um, both of these policies are big wins and they'll significantly reduce costs for people with CF who rely on these programs. So we were proud to be a part of that and thrilled to see them passed. And we'll keep, keep at it. There's a lot, a lot more to do. Um, and, it, you know, I, I'm really proud that the CF story is really front and center when you think about care and coverage um, in, in the federal discussion. Yeah. And Mary, I'm going to congratulate you and your team, particularly on the Medicare out-of-pocket cap. That's a big deal. I can think of a list of people that come to mind who are going to benefit from that, particularly with modulators. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think, you know, uh, when you meet the, see this team, I think you understand why I'm excited about the future and confident about the future. And I uh, just want to thank the, the panelists tonight. Um, you know, if, if because we started a little late, if you need to go, I understand, but we're going to stick around. We're going to answer questions because I think that's something we want to be able to, to answer as many as we can. Um, if you have them, uh, type them in the Q&A box. Uh, we're going to try to get to them. I'm going to... Um, Maybe I'll start off with one that I saw sort of bubbling up a bunch. And I'm actually asked Whitney to come on. So Whitney, there was a lot of uh, talk in the chat about being older with CF. I'm this old, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm older. And uh, you've been thinking about some things or some, some research and some things to particularly uh, help uh, as people get older with CF. I don't know, you want to talk a little about some of those specialized topics that sometimes come up as you get older with CF? Happy to happy that we're discussing this and these are issues we're thinking about. So obviously a longer lifespan means meeting more milestones and such as fertility, uh, raising a family and, and managing uh, health effects of aging. So I'll talk a little bit about um, fertility to start with. Um, I, I know many people have heard that the number of pregnancies in women with CF has dramatically increased over the last few years and up to 675 in 2021. And we are supporting a study of, of pregnancy to see, to follow what happens uh, with women uh, in CF called Mayflowers. And I, I got word um, yesterday that, that the study has already enrolled more than 100 females, and we will see hear some of the initial results this summer. So that's very exciting. And, but we know parenthood goes way beyond just pregnancy. And so in conjunction with the NIH, we are supporting a study called Hope CF. And that's going to be looking at how becoming a parent uh, impacts people's physical and mental health. And then um, the last thing I'll mention sort of in this aging space is the Envision program. Um, and we're about to start another round of this Envision uh, uh, program that we support this summer. And this is a three-year program that supports endocrinologists to develop a, a career in CF. And this can include specialists in reproductive health, as well as bone disease and CF-related diabetes, all of which um, as we know, are related to aging. Good. Well, thank you. This is a high class, uh, high class challenge. So, it, uh, uh, thank you for your work on that. Um, you know, Steve, I'm going to ask you to come back on and ask you specifically about some of your uh, area of, of real expertise, the things you've been working on. So, sort of those nonsense and rare mutations. And I know there's a couple of people who put in their their mutations in there and. Uh, there's there's a lot, a lot going on there that we actually didn't talk about. So can you give us a little bit more? Sure, sure. Happy to talk about this. Obviously, it's extremely urgent because we know uh, that people with nonsense mutations uh, uh, can sometimes have two of them. There are other rare mutations that people can have one or two of, and that leaves them uh, not eligible for TRICAFTA. And, and that's uh, really just been an untenable uh, situation for us and one that uh, continues to motivate us to, to help uh, fix this problem. You, you know, but others may not, that 
the, the first experiments um, that I ever did in the lab actually were with JP's help uh, on nonsense mutations. And our lab continues to have uh, efforts in this in, in this area, uh, along with the foundation. And you can hear more about this on the on the plenary talk that we talked about this group of uh, mutations, and that's available uh, on recording. One of the I'll, I'll highlight a few though uh, that uh, I, I really do want to emphasize. One is uh, there are continued efforts with Southern Research, uh, including uh, uh, some folks in our laboratory and other partner laboratories where we're developing now. A more than one chemical series that that cause translational read through, and, and we've uh, since uh, found some that are even independent of aminoglycosides. So th this means uh, that we need to push harder on this series. We don't know if those will be drugs yet or, or not, but we're really encouraged by this and, and and pushing hard. One of the other areas that that um, has been really unique about the foundation, and one thing that encouraged me to to to, to join you uh, in this role is, is the ability to put together. Uh, different pieces and re, uh, to get a translational read through and other nonsense mutations, we know we're going to have to put together different pieces of the puzzle uh, to make to, to make this work. That's uh, not uncharted territory for us. Correctors took more uh, and potentiators had to be combined to develop into the CFT modulator we know now as Trikafta. And uh, we're uh, thinking about this uh, very rigorously and what other partners we might need to bring in uh, to, uh, to, to make this work. So that's that's one. Another another uh, group of mutations uh, uh, that is in our top 10 list of most common that are still not covered from modulators are the splice mutations. These are complicated. Uh, uh, the genetic mechanisms are complicated, but in a sense, some people can have residual function and be have a more mild case of CF, but there are other splice mutations that uh, uh, cause so, uh, severe CF um, for uh, uh, for those that you don't know, one of the new medications called an antisense oligonucleotide that result in an, in an approval for another disease, uh, spinal mus muscular atrophy, was called spinraza. It's a, un an unbelievable success as an antisense oligonucleotide. We can start to think about this now doing in CF and in and, and CF. We're trying to learn from those lessons and apply that. Uh, we've had prior collaborations with Ionis, a major company that, that works in this space. Um, uh, 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 another is with Splice Sense, where we're targeting 3849 mutation. That's now entering a clinical study in, in, in normal volunteers to get ready. Uh, so uh, those are a few efforts. And then finally, um, uh, we've already talked, JP, and then uh, detailed what we're doing in CFTR mRNA therapy. We think this is a, 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 a major uh, uh, importance because it should work regardless of what mutation that you, that you have. So that represents another uh, major effort. And then why we have three independent uh, uh, studies that are all in, in late phase, getting ready to enter uh, clinical studies. Uh, Mer Vertex Moderna as a collaboration is already there. Uh, we, we've ha we've we had a miss in with with our partner Translate Bio, but we've learned a ton from that experience, and we're helping it uh, with our new uh, partners uh, apply those lessons to to try again. So th those are a few of the things that we're doing in this in this space, but th but there are also others. Mm, that's fantastic, and you know I would, I would encourage for people who are really interested in this area is go watch the first plenary from this last NACFC. Uh, uh, Steve had a chance to talk some about this and hear those. There's even more details there so people can dive in because it's obvious we could talk about this all night. There's a lot going on. So thank you, Steve. Um, actually, Tiffany, as much as we talked about phage, there's still a decent amount of uh, love and questions about phage. So I don't know, can you give us a little bit more about, because I know, I guess you mentioned two companies, but there's, there's even more going on in this space, uh, isn't there? There is, Mike. Um, in fact, we we are funding actually three companies from an industry perspective, but from a clinical uh, research and basic research perspective, we actually are funding over two, 20 programs. So we are really interrogating the science, you know, and I think another point to mention is that phase is a very is very busy across other infections. Um, and I bring that up because I talked about data generation this year. So obviously our trials that we're supporting will read out, but a number of phage trials will have some regulatory interactions this year. And that's important because we are really looking for guidance from the regulatory agencies on how we can potentially get this product to market. So I think with some of the data that's being generated, we're hoping that there'll be some regulatory interactions that will lead to more guidance. Um, also, we're gonna keep our, you know, our, 
our antennas open up and, and really look at what's going on in the phage space. There's a number of conferences this year that we'll also attend to make sure that we're staying in tune with the science of phage. But ultimately, we really want to kind of use this data to help prioritize, as I mentioned, and really think about what other phage, phage programs we can get behind that will support the CF community more. So right. lots of great stuff going on in phage, and um, I'm sure we'll continue to see that happening for some time. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I'm actually going to ask JP to come on next because there's a bunch of questions about GI. Uh, and so, uh, JP, this is actually, I know, something that you and Dara and your team have spent a lot of time. I mean, there's a couple of different flavors as I look through this. Some of this is, anyway, tell us just in general about that area, but also I think there's some specific questions about the uh, ability to, uh, that we've seen to maybe to rescue pancreatic function early on. Yeah. If you start treating early, what's that? Are there other things with uh, motility agents that might be helpful? Uh, so it, it, the floor is yours. Tell us about GI. <laughs> you just give me a nice little topic like that? No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on with GI. And I'm going to give you a couple that have sort of progressed over time. I, I think you probably may have heard uh, through time the study that was called Galaxy. And what that study, the goal of that was really to be able to start to developing the, what we call outcome measures that could be used in clinical trials to help us understand what uh, interventions, what therapies were actually helping. Um, that we just didn't really have anything very well established in CF. And uh, that study, after sort of characterizing a number, uh, adapting some outcome measures to CF, was used in PROMISE. And with that, what was seen in PROMISE was that there were some things in the GI tract in, in terms of symptoms and sort of day-to-day uh, GI things that, uh, that some got better, but some did not is the bottom line. And it sort of spurred us to, to think about, you know, what are some of the other types of studies that we can be doing to really start moving the needle for people who have ongoing uh, GI symptoms. And uh, I was just uh, going to highlight one that's getting ready to get off the ground. And it's a, it sort of brings together GI nutrition and uh, sort of strength and uh, body composition. And I, I had to get my little thing out here because it's a, it's a long one. It's called Strong CF, and it stands for Strength and Muscle Related Outcomes for Nutrition and Lung Function in CF. So Strong CF is really trying to look at that relationship between nutrition and uh, pulmonary outcomes, and it also incorporates a lot of uh, better uh, looking more carefully at the GI symptoms and the gut microbiome. Um, and then uh, the other piece that I wanted to say was, oh, in, in regards to uh, sort of pancreatic therapies, or can, is anything going to restore it? Yes and no. Um, we think modulators, if started early enough, may be able to preserve uh, the pancreas. Um, and we've seen that with some of the uh, studies that have gone on with, for example, Ivacafter, getting down into younger and younger kids. It's Kaleidico. Um, we have every reason to believe we'll see that with some of these other modulators as they get into kids under the age of uh, two and one years year of age. As people are older, it is a very, it's a much more difficult problem, as you might guess. Um, the, the, the pancreas gets really damaged and it's sometimes very difficult to, um, to really sort of restore that function, if that makes sense. We are exploring sort of better and different types of uh, enzyme therapies that uh, may be smaller pills, more effective pills, um, and less frequent. And so I would say that the, the door is not closed on that and we are definitely paying attention to it. And finally, I guess I would just say that we have been partnering with the NIH and some to really to try to better understand sort of basic science biology of the pancreas. We co-hosted a, uh, uh, a workshop with them last year. The results of those should be coming out in publication um, in the next few months. And the uh, point is we're really trying to move the needle and better understanding um, uh, how that, how CFTR problems turn into pancreas problems, both in terms of exocrine or the, the enzymes and also diabetes. And so I could go on a long time. I'll stop because there's plenty of other questions. So, but okay. lots, think, lots of action. Uh, two of the things that jump out from that one was a specific question about can, uh, you know, can try calf to rescue the pancreas only if it's really early. And, but that's the exciting part. If you start really early, it looks like there's some, uh, uh, we're talking at a, a year or two of age or less. Um, and so uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, so I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna ask Mary to come on. And um, I see how early, like what age? We're talking like below the age of two and maybe even younger. Um, so um, 
Mary, I think uh, while we're here together as a community, you've been paying a lot of attention on some of the changes on the Vertex copay and trying to make sure that we help it, uh, minimize its effects on people. Can you just talk uh, sort of briefly about sort of what's going on, a little update, and then sort of what we're going to be doing in this upcoming couple of weeks? Yeah, so let me just quickly make sure everyone's on the same page of what we're talking about. So in October of last year, Vertex publicly announced changes to its copay assistance program, including a decision to significantly decrease the amount of assistance they provide for people whose insurance includes either an accumulator or maximizer plan. These are new insurance programs um, that do not count manufacturer copay assistance towards deductibles and um, out-of-pocket pocket expenses. Um, and those changes went into effect on January 1st. Um, so we've, we've expressed significant concern to Vertex numerous times that they've underestimated the scope of the impact of these programs that they have on the CF community. And we worry that these program changes will have a larger impact than anticipated by Vertex. So as of January 1st, we are very closely monitoring the impact of these changes for people with cystic fibrosis. Um, as I said, we voiced concerns already about the increased cost burden to the community, including cost burden for many people who switched what kind of insurance they had to try to avoid these caps that we're putting into place and therefore increase their cost of their insurance. Um, and also a heavy administrative burden. We are hearing about an enormous amount of time that people are spending and taking away from care, um, both for people with CF and their care teams. And you can see our statement um, and all the information, additional information on these changes. I think somebody just popped it into the chat. Um, so we continue to engage with Vertex uh, weekly, if not more frequently, about what we're seeing and work with care teams to make sure that um, we can help people navigate through these changes as, as people are slogging through this. On the advocacy side, um, we strongly oppose accumulator and maximizer programs, and we have for many, many years. Um, we continue to advocate for bans of this type of program and insurance programs. We're pleased that several states, um, 16, have passed bans. We've been at the table for every one of those. And we know that several more states are proposing bans this year. Um, so we'll be at it again in those states uh, and pushing more states to, in, to introduce and pass bans. And there's also a federal law that's been proposed um, that we support and will be advocating for. Um, so watch your inbox for advocacy alerts, either at the state or federal level. This will be a, another high priority for us. Perfect. Well, thank you, Mary. I do know your team's there. I, I can picture them monitoring, ready to go at, at a moment's notice and, and being strategic. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go for maybe five more minutes. And I'm going to ask each of the panelists to think about what they're most excited about in the short. But let's do a little bit of a rocket round uh, since it's late. Um, but uh, Whitney, uh, I have a question that says, I have a nine-year-old son with CF on Trikafta. Uh, tell me about how you think that life, his life is going to be different now than somebody maybe a 10 years ago uh, before, before Trikafta. Wow. Um, yeah, that's not exactly right. That's all I can, exactly. that's all I can say. Um, you know, I think everything that, that we've known, um, you know all the all the guidance we have to we have to really uh, think about and review again. I think life could be very different. Um, delaying the need for uh, for 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 so many things. I mean, just living a, a fuller life, engaged in having much less of life dominated by uh, treatments, by um, by worries, and uh, and 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 really focusing more on achieving dreams. And and then and then obviously um, there will be complications that come, but if we can delay them a decade or two, or if if by then we have better treatments, better care, I think that the future um, is, is so bright. Hmm. Yeah, no, agree. And I, I think some of the studies that are ongoing right now are going to are going to inform us about this, right? As we see uh, some of the the benefits of stabilization of lung function and effect on the the, the pancreas, both you know on the diabetes side. There's a lot we're going to learn. So it's going to be an exciting, exciting time going forward. So thank you for that. Um, that um, one, of, one of the questions I see on here is just uh, asking about sort of newborn screening. And uh, Mary, Mary, maybe you can, uh, if you want to, you can jump on uh, to, to answer this. But I think the specific thing was about, uh, is there going to be uh, immediate testing for thousands of thousands of mutations? And I think 
there's still an opportunity to have an initial screen. The question is, what do you do with that screen and whether or not you do something limited, which means you miss people, or whether or not you do something more complete, looking at the DNA, which would be more comprehensive. We think that if you're screen positive, we want to be more complete after that so that we don't miss people. But I don't know, Mary, anything else specific in your conversations that you wanted to add to that? or? Okay, I'll hit two two things with one because I am really excited about our newborn screening work. So this will be my, what am I excited about too? Um, at a high level, Mike, you nailed it um, in terms of the complexity of what do we screen. So just giving a little more color to the work ahead, it's what's best practice, right? Getting, getting experts not only in CF and CF diagnosis, but also working really closely with the state public health labs who run these tests to know how, how do we best capture the most people with CF. We want to get everyone. Right, and, and we also want to avoid false positives. So nailing down what that panel should look like. And then as, as I said, every state does it differently. And so this isn't a one best practice. We're gonna to have to take it and implement it 51 different times. Don't forget about where I am, the District of Columbia, they do it differently too. Um, and so how do we implement that best practice in all states? And really also importantly, working with a broad array of partners. So CF experts, uh, newborn screening experts, state newborn labs, legislators, governors, you know, administrators in states to make sure these labs are funded for that best practice. And then another thing I think we're really excited about and have folks on our committee is um, pediatricians, family docs, who may who are often going to be the first person who gets that call that something has has popped up in that newborn screen and having them really understand the full perspective of who may have CF, which babies, with the ultimate goal of getting every baby who has CF identified early, diagnosed early, and right into that specialized care. Because when you hear those stories about saving the pancreas, you know, it just so emphasizes why this is such a critical piece. So we're excited about it. There's a lot of work ahead. Um, but we've got a great team. I impact. Exactly. Well, thank you. And just to make sure we hit everybody's question, I see the last one here. I'll just take quickly. We just asked about certain infections. So uh, fungal infections, things like ABPA or fungal infections, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. The answer is we absolutely. We, we, we were supporting an antifungal company in one of their trials. We mentioned earlier some of the work in non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Some of that's fade. Some of that's actually uh, supporting other trials or other work that's even outside of CF that might benefit people with CF. So those specialty infections are ones that we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to be helpful. So I'm going to ask everybody to come on, all the panelists to come on, uh, to bring us home here with, give me one thing that uh, you're just excited about in 2023, uh, that you're particularly looking forward to, or that you that, that gets you going in the morning. I'll uh, start. I'll start. Okay. Um, I'm really excited building on some of the things Whitney was talking about. I'm really excited that we're, we're looking holistically at, at what it is to have CF, not just clinically, um, that we're thinking about life with CF, wellness, um, all the different financial needs. And um, we're really diving in and rolling up our sleeves in a different way this year. So I'm excited about that. I'm going to go call out on my screen here as I go down. So next person on my screen is JP. JP, what are you excited Ooh, about? I got to go early because it always gets harder when you go late. No, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm super excited about uh, some um, hopefully getting a, a, a little bit of data from early clinical trial results that are going to be coming out this year. And um, they're, uh, they're the not some of these novel things that are coming along. So obviously genetic-based therapies. There's some exciting stuff we're hoping to see. And the other is some novel approaches to treat infections. And I won't go into detail, but there's some stuff just on the cusp. And I think it's going to really help us point some directions over the next year where we really need to uh, really uh, dig in with, uh, with two hands. That's great. Tiffany, you're next on mine. And then uh, Whitney, you're on deck. Sure. So, um, I think when I when I really think about what's exciting this year is our expanding community. We talked a lot about um, all the things that we need to do to provide service for all. And I think that um, we truly will be stronger together. Um, and I think it really makes me excited, but it also brings me joy to know that we'll have more impact for more people. Um, and that that's really exciting. Yeah, well said. Whitney, and then Dr. Rowe. 
I'm really excited to see how CF Care Delivery and our awesome care centers across the country continues to change and be agile and adapt to meet the needs of all people with CF. And those uh, the, the six multi-center studies I mentioned that are really looking at tools to enhance the way that uh, we care for people with CF, I think that's going to guide the way. And so the work this year, I'm hoping we'll get an early readout at the North American Conference in the fall to see uh, what's working well. Hmm. Thank you. Steve. Well, I'll build on a theme that that really everybody has said, um, and that is two genetic uh, studies that work for people regardless of the mutation and start to enroll people uh, that don't have a therapy uh, uh, right now. And that, and that is a, a one that's ongoing uh, with 4D molecular that's looking at a, a genetic therapy that uh, delivers a CFTR, and the other will be the mRNA therapies that will all uh, or some are begun and some, some are, are shortly behind. Uh, this is going to be really exciting time for, for paving the way for the cure. Hmm. That's great. Well, guys, I want to say thank you uh, on behalf of everybody with CF. On behalf of, uh, uh, thank you for your, your leadership in this. Obviously, we're excited for the, the, the future. And uh, um, as I uh, say goodnight to everybody, I think, and as I look ahead, mine is actually similar to Steve's in some ways. I'm just excited. We've been talking about Path to a Cure for a while now, and it's been building. And now we're actually to the point where we're doing some tr clinical trials involved with Path to a Cure, right? So it's not just a someday thing. And I'm excited that we're being more aggressive than ever to make sure that we have a pipeline of these future therapies and being very proactive. We can talk about that another time, a whole team that's uh, doing that. And then I'm excited about the continued collaboration with you, uh, with the community, trying to get this right, working together, getting your perspectives, your feedback, your hopes, your dreams for the future. And just thank you for your passion and your support. You know, at the CF Foundation, we spend a lot of time not just talking about how to do things, but the why. And I can tell you that uh, you and your families are our why each and every day. And you inspire our team. You've seen that tonight. We look forward to partnering with you in 2023 and uh, working to continue to this amazing uh, CF story. So with that, I'm going to say once again, thank you. Good night. Looking forward to an exciting 2023.